There are many mechanical elements that rely on friction, but we will focus on just one additional application, belt friction. For the whole semester, we've been talking about pulleys as frictionless, and there are many instances where this is appropriate and reasonable. But there are also plenty of applications where pulleys transmit torque from one location to another, and this is only possible when the pulley engages the belt through friction. To derive this relationship between tensions on either side of the pulley, we will consider a slightly different situation from that of torque transmission. In this case, we have a belt contacting a portion of a cylinder that is fixed or anchored to a supporting surface. An unseen force is attempting to drag the belt across the cylinder, and we'd like to know the relationship between the tensions on either side of the belt. The only difference between this case and that of torque transmission is that in this case the cylinder is fixed and the source of the motion is outside the figure. In the case of torque transmission, the source of motion is a motor or other device providing the driving rotational motion, and the belt reacts to the cylinder's motion. The difference in driving motion does not alter the relationship between the pulley tensions, but it can change what we will call the high side tension and the low side tension. In these problems, we will want to identify the source of the motion first to determine where the tension is high and where it is low. This will become more apparent as we look at some examples. To derive the relationship giving the maximum difference in tensions, we will assume that we are on the threshold of slip at every contact point along the belt. Consider a finite angular increment of width delta theta at the top of the cylinder. Since the premise is that something is trying to drag the belt across the cylinder from right to left, the direction of the friction force on the belt is opposing that motion. Since it is presumed that we are on the threshold of slip everywhere, the magnitude of that friction force is the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Writing equilibrium component equations in x and y, we get the two equilibrium equations shown here. You can probably tell where we're going with this. We will get a governing equation for the changing relationship in tension by letting this small, finite angular increment become a differential increment. Before doing that, however, we'll take advantage of the small argument expansions of the cosine and sine functions to generate a simpler governing equation. We'll first note that small argument expansions for the cosine and sine functions can be used for dimensionless arguments x. That in turn will mean that when we look at these expansions, the delta thetas will be given in radians and not degrees. For x much less than 1, we have these Taylor series expansions for cosine and sine. Since we're dealing with small argument expansions, we'll get rid of the higher order terms and just approximate cosine of x as 1 and sine of x as x. If we do that, our governing equations turn into these. The cosine delta theta over 2 becomes 1, and our x equation becomes minus t minus delta t plus t plus mu delta n equals 0. In y, the sine delta theta over 2 becomes delta theta over 2, and we end up with minus t delta theta over 2 minus delta t delta theta over 2 minus t delta theta over 2 plus delta n equals 0. Now we're eventually going to let delta theta become very small, and so this second order term in the equation for y is going to disappear compared to the other first order terms, and then separately these two tensions cancel, and you can see what we're left with in both the x and y equilibrium equations are all terms that are order delta to the first order. So there's a delta t and a delta n, a delta theta, but there's no product of deltas or there's no uh, terms that don't have a delta. So all the terms are of the same order. And what we end up with then 
in the first equation is delta t is equal to mu delta n, and the second equation becomes t delta theta equals delta n. Now if we just take the first equation and divide it by the second equation, the delta n goes away and what we end up with is delta t over t delta theta is equal to the friction coefficient or delta t over delta theta equals mu times the tension. Now letting delta theta go to d theta, we have this differential relationship between tension and angular increment. This is a separable differential equation that can be integrated to give the result t2 equals t1 e to the mu beta. In this expression, t2 is the high side tension and t1 is the low side tension. Within the exponential factor, beta is the contact angle measured in radians. Note that the exponential factor is always greater than or equal to 1. In the limit that we go back to a frictionless condition, the exponential argument becomes 0 and we get back to t2 equals t1. Determination of the contact angle or angle of wrap is sometimes a source of confusion. Let's suppose for argument's sake that we're, we're given the angles theta 1 and theta 2 that the belts make with the horizontal as we come off the pulley. Remember that these always come off at 90 degree angles. So we can determine relatively quickly what the angle of wrap will be uh, based on these relationships. So for instance, I know that if theta 1 is the angle that the belt on the right makes with the horizontal, then this angle is pi over 2 minus theta 1 based on the 90 degree angle that the horizontal and vertical axes make. And then because this comes off at 90 degrees, uh, this angle will be uh, theta 1 as well. We can see that that angle is pi over 2 minus quantity pi over 2 minus theta 1. So that's theta 1. And therefore, this is theta 1. And by a similar argument, we could say that if the angle that the belt on the left comes off the horizontal at theta 2, then this is also theta 2. And therefore, that beta, the angle of wrap, is theta 1 plus theta 2. It is important to keep in mind that the relationship t2 equals t1 e to the mu beta represents the largest possible disparity between the tensions on either side of the pulley. It assumes that slip is occurring or impending slip is occurring everywhere, everywhere along the angle of wrap. In problems involving multiple belt cylinder contact surfaces, not every belt cylinder surface may be on the threshold of slip. Here we have an example involving two points of engagement between pulleys and belts. A motor at C is being used to drive a pulley that is transmitting a torque used to drive an air fan. The dashed blue arrow at D shows the direction of motion, telling us that the motor at C is providing a clockwise torque. The motor at C is the ultimate source of motion, and this will tell us where the high and low side tensions occur on the belt. We are asked to choose an additional weight, W sub E, so that the belt does not slip anywhere in the assembly. Note that we have different friction coefficients and different angles of wrap between the two contact areas at D and C, so it's unlikely that we will reach slip simultaneously at both locations. Let's take some time now to look at the solution. The problem statement tells us that we need a 100 inch-pound moment to be transferred to D. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have the high side tension is going to be here. We're providing a clockwise torque to this air fan. So the high side tension will be here and the low side tension will be over here. And we have that T2 times the radius of the fan at D minus T1 
times the radius of the fan at D has to be equal to 100 inch-pounds. And because the radius at D is given as 5 inches, this tells us that T2 minus T1 has to be equal to 20 pounds. So that's the first important piece of information we have. Now the maximum possible difference between T2 and T1 will be based on threshold slip at either D or C, so we'll take a look at both of those independently. First we'll note that the pulley radius at C is different from the pulley radius at D, and that means that the belts are not purely vertically oriented. They make a five degree angle off the vertical. This in turn will mean that we have a slightly larger angle of wrap at D than we do at C. If, they, if the pulley belt were purely vertical, uh, the angle of wrap in C and D would be identical. It would be 180 degrees or pi radians. What will happen in this case is it will have five degrees less than that on either side at C. So the, the angle of wrap will be 170 degrees at C and it will be uh, 190 degrees at D. So we'll have, so we have a larger angle of wrap at D but a smaller friction coefficient and a smaller angle of wrap at C and a larger friction coefficient. And we have to take a look at both cases to see where we, we are able to tolerate a, a larger differential tension on either side of the belt. Based on threshold slip at D, we would have T2 over T1 max is equal to E to the friction coefficient at D times the angle of wrap at D. And again, beta D is going to be 190 degrees times pi over 180 degrees. So we'll get this in radians, and it's 3.316 radians. And so we end up with uh, T2 over T1 max. That's equal to E to the 0.25 times 3.316. And that number turns out to be 2.2911. Based on threshold slip at C, we have e to the mu c beta c and here beta c is equal to 170 degrees times pi over 180 degrees and that value turns out to be equal to 2.967 radians but we have a larger friction coefficient at c And so this is equal to e to the 0.3 times 2.967, and that number turns out to be 2.435. Okay, so that tells us we can tolerate a larger differential tension at the motor than we can at the air fan, uh, but we're limited by uh, the, the smaller of these two values. So what we're going to have in this case is we're going to have slip, or we'll be on the threshold of slip, at the air fan, but not at the motor. Okay, now, to determine what this weight should be, we're going to come back up to our, we're going to come back up to our assembly and draw an enveloping surface around this motor and where it cuts through the rest of the assembly. So we're obviously cutting through the belt here and here, and we're actually going to know those two tensions based on the information that we have so far. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, a pin support at A, and we've got the weights of the motor at C and the additional weight at E that we're trying to find. So let's draw a free body diagram based on that. Okay, so here's our free body diagram of the motor platform. We have the pin supports at A. Uh, we have the two tensions coming off the uh, small pulley that's attached to the motor and we have the weight WC of the motor and the additional weight WE that we're trying to find. Uh, now, it may look like that we've got um, five unknowns in this problem, but we actually have three because we know T1 and T2. From the information that we previously had, we have that T2 minus T1 
is equal to 20 pounds. That was the requirement from the torque provided by the air fan, provided to the air fan. And separately now, we know that uh, T2 over T1 is going to be on the threshold of slip at the air fan, and that's going to be equal to 2.2911. So if we write T2 as 2.2911 T1 and put that into the first equation, we end up with this, and that ends up giving us that T1 is equal to 15.49 pounds, and then T2 is 35.49 pounds. Okay, so how should we go about solving this problem? We have three unknowns, those being the pin reactions AX and AY, and the additional weight WE that we're trying to find in the problem. Uh, we also have the issue of whether or not we leave the uh, belts on the pulley or we take them off and how, how that changes the problem. Uh, you'll remember that when we talked about uh, whether or not we would leave the, um, the belts on the pulley, depending on whether or not they made some odd angle with the vertical or horizontal, and we sort of have that here because we've got this five degree angle off the vertical, which suggests that we would, we would like to take them off because if we try to find, if, we're, if we would be inclined, for instance, to take moments about A, which, which would give us just the one unknown WE, uh, that would be a problem because we would have to find the specific location on the pulley where the line of action of the forces T2 and T1 come off. So I'm going to, for my first solution, I'm going to leave these on, but to make things a little easier, I'm going to take moments about someplace other than A. Um, that will give us the other complication, though, that we'll have a kind of a full set of, of uh, equations that we'll have to solve. We'll have to solve some of the forces in X and Y and some of the moments, in this case I'm going to use about C, um, we'll have to solve those simultaneously. So here's a first solution. What I'm going to do is say uh, some of the forces in X equals zero and uh, that's going to give me T2 sine of five degrees minus T1 sine of five degrees plus AX is equal to zero. And I can solve for AX directly there. I just turn this around. And that value is equal to minus 1.743 pounds. If I write some of the forces in Y equals 0, I have T2 cosine 5 degrees plus T1 cosine 5 degrees minus the motor weight at C minus the weight we're trying to find at E plus AY equals zero. Now I can turn that around and write AY is equal to WC plus WE minus quantity T1 plus T2 cosine five degrees. And if I plug numbers in, I end up with AY is equal to, uh, I have 30 pounds plus WE minus uh, this last term turns out to be 50.79 pounds and I end up with WE minus 20.79 pounds. Okay, so on that basis now I know AX and I know AY and uh, now I can take moments about C uh, because it's it's relatively easy for me to get the uh, the torque that's provided by the tensions T2 and T1 about C. Again, they just come off here at 90 degree angles. Uh, so it's uh, the moment arm is simply the radius of that pulley. It's going to be two inches. And actually I know that T2 minus T1 is 20 pounds, so the net result of those two torques about C is just going to be 40 inch pounds. And so I'll end up with a, a moment equation about C that looks like this. I have T2 minus T1 times the pulley radius of two inches. That's going to give me 40 inch pounds. And then I have a plus AX times its moment arm, which is eight inches. I have a minus AY times its moment arm, which is 15 inches, equals zero. And that's nice because neither WC or WE contributes. Their lines of action also go right through C. So that's my moment equation. And I know this value, it's going to be 40 inch pounds. Now I'll substitute in for AX and AY, and I get 40 inch pounds from this first term, minus 1.743 pounds 
times 8 inches. And then for AY, we have minus quantity WE minus 20.79 pounds times 15 inches equals 0. And I can turn that around and write the weight at E is equal to 20.79 pounds plus this term. And this value turns out to be 1.737 pounds. And so my weight at E is equal to 22.53 pounds. Okay, though, that wasn't so bad, except for we did something a little bit different here. We ended up taking moments about C, just because we didn't want to find specific distances from lines of action of the forces from T2 and T1 to the pin at A. So the question is, could we have done this by taking the pulley off the motor um, and somehow transferring the uh, pulley forces directly to the bearing at C. And in fact, we can do that. It looks a little bit different from what we've done previously. So here's a second solution where the first thing we're going to do is remove the pulley from the motor. So what does that look like? So remember that the motor is exerting a torque on the pulley, and it's a, a clockwise torque. So here is the pulley, and I'll put a a clockwise torque on that uh, exerted by the motor on the pulley and here we have the two uh, tensions coming off here. Here's T2 and T1 and then uh, we've got a uh, pulley bearing so we would have forces CX and CY on the pulley and then on the motor I won't draw the whole platform just right now. I'll just focus on the, uh, the motor. Okay, we would have equal and opposite loads at the center here. So that would be, so that would be a counterclockwise moment M and forces CX and CY that would look like this. So let's just think about what that implies. So if I take a look first at the pulley, moment equilibrium about its center is going to say that the, the value of this clockwise moment provided by the motor is going to end up being uh, T2 minus T1 times the radius of the pulley at C. That's the 40 inch-pounds, this clockwise moment. And then if we had a uh, force equilibrium for this pulley based on a vector approach, what would that look like? Well, that would look like the bearing reactions here at C plus the forces T1 plus T2 equals zero, which would say that the uh, bearing forces at C exerted uh, on the pulley bearing by the motor would be minus T1 plus T2. Okay, but that would also say then down here that the forces exerted on the, uh, on the motor by the pulley bearing would be equal to would be equal and opposite to that, they would be T1 plus T2. So what we would end up with for the motor would be T2 and T1 transferred directly to the bearing center plus this moment, this counterclockwise moment M that has a value of 40 inch-pounds. Now you can think about this as well from an equivalent force system perspective. If we take the uh, tensions off the pulley and shift them to the center, we are reducing the uh, counterclockwise moment provided by T2 by T2 times the radius, and we are reducing the clockwise moment uh, imparted by T1 by T1 times the radius. So the net result of moving T2 and T1 to the center is a, a net reduction of moment that they exert about uh, the center of the motor by 40 inch-pounds. So we're adding, if you like, we're adding back 40 inch-pounds from this moment in order to get an equivalent set of loads provided to the motor by the pulley. What we end up with then for the motor platform assembly once we remove the pulley looks like this. So we've shifted the lines of action of the high and low side tensions to C and provided this compensating moment M uh, exerted by the pulley, equal and opposite exerted by the pulley on the motor. 
Now we can take moments about A and solve directly for the, the load at E. So if we write some of the moments about A equals zero, what we're going to have now is uh, the vertical components of the tensions, T2 plus T1 cosine 5 degrees times a moment arm of 15 inches. And then we have the uh, net horizontal components acting through a moment arm of 8 inches, and that's going to be minus T2 minus T1 sine of 5 degrees times 8 inches. And then we have minus the weight at C times 15 inches, minus the weight at E times 15 inches, and then we have that compensating moment M of 40 inch pounds. So we re rearrange this, we get the weight at E is equal to T2 plus T1 cosine 5 degrees minus T2 minus T1 sine of 5 degrees times a ratio of 8 to 15 inches minus the weight at C plus 40 inch pounds over 15 inches. And if we plug in our values for T1 and T2 and our 30 pounds for WC, this once again turns out to be 22.53 pounds. So we can get the value for this weight by either leaving the belt on the pulley or taking it off. Uh, the difference now is that because the tensions are not the same on the high side and the low side, we've got this compensating moment, if you like, from shifting the lines of action of the forces, but it's still possible to get the solution either way. Finally, for our last example, we have an emergency braking system used to cut off power to a saw when there is imminent danger of the saw blade engaging flesh. We are asked to determine a critical dimension D so that the brake is self-locking. In this context, self-locking means the brake is capable of applying finite braking forces to the drum with the application of an infinitesimally small driving force P. In the context of rotational motion, the motor to the saw is providing a driving torque that causes the saw to rotate counterclockwise in this figure. The brake must oppose this motion, exerting a net clockwise torque to slow the saw, and this in turn implies that the high side tension will be along the bottom portion of the strip that meets the brake arm at C. So our high side tension will be here, and our low side tension will be here. Now let's take a look at the free body diagram of the brake arm. So we're going to isolate the brake arm and take a look at moment equilibrium about the pin at B. So we have our low side tension here, and we have our high side tension here, and we're applying our driving force, and we're applying our braking force P at this location at D. So in this case, the saw is spinning. We're going to have slip everywhere along the surface, and we're going to know that uh, T2 is going to be equal to T1 e to the mu times beta. And beta in this case is just 180 degrees or pi. So that's going to be our relationship. And we know from the problem statement that the friction coefficient is 0.5. So now if we take some of the moments about b and set that equal to 0, we have our uh, force p exerting a counterclockwise moment about b, and that's 130 less 40 millimeters, or 0.09 meters. And then we've got a counterclockwise moment from the high side tension, which is T1 e to the mu pi times the distance d that we're trying to find. And we have, uh, from the low side tension, a clockwise moment that's minus T1 80 millimeters minus d, or 0.08 minus d meters, and that has to equal zero. So if we turn that around and solve for t1, we end up with this expression. We get t1 is equal to p times this ratio. And this is only going to be a meaningful expression if this, if this denominator is positive. So that tells us that 0.08 meters minus d minus d e to the mu pi has to be greater than zero, 
and we can turn that inequality around and write d must be less than 0.08 meters over 1 plus e to the mu pi. And for mu equal to half, uh, this value turns out to be 0 0.01377 meters or equal to 13.77 millimeters. Now we probably don't want to make it exactly that value. We probably want it to be just slightly less than that, but you can see that if d is slightly less than that value, uh, the application of a small force p will give a relatively large force t1 and provide the breaking moment that we need in order to slow the saw.